Happy Monday, everybody. Hope y'all had an awesome Halloween. <laughs> and um, this is going to be the final video lesson for unit three. I, I've told you guys it was going to go pretty quick. And um, I know I haven't posted the uh, weekly board yet, but y'all will be actually testing over this on Wednesday uh, over all of unit three. So like you know, the early Christian church, Justinian and the Byzantine Empire, and then the age of Charlemagne that we're going to be talking about today. Y'all are going to be tested over all of that come Wednesday. So uh, as I said, you know, it's a pretty quick, um, quick unit. Unit four is also going to be quick. Uh, just FYI, you'll probably be testing on unit four next Wednesday again. Um, it, it goes, it goes just as quick as this one does. So, um, you know, and, and they're just, it's just because they're just naturally shorter units. Uh, Rome, of course, is a bit of a beast when it comes to studying it because it's so big and it lasts for so long. Um, and then, uh, then we will get into, after unit four, we will get into medieval Europe and that's another kind of big unit. So we will actually stay within unit five uh, until we leave for Christmas break. So you know, just kind of giving you a heads up, you know, if you're kind of like, my God, she seems to be just flying through this information here lately. It was just because these two units are short. So uh, anyways, like I said, I hope you guys had an awesome weekend and happy Halloween. And, you know, now we get to move forward into Thanksgiving and then Christmas. So this year is just rolling right along despite, um, you know, how different it is. But um Today, we're talking about Charlemagne, who is nicknamed um, the father of Europe. And it's because, you know, a lot of times when you think of Europe, you think of kings and lords and ladies and knights and things like that. But the reality is, is it, it takes a little bit for, for Europe to develop into that, you know, and, and before that happens, it's tribal. And we've talked about this, obviously, with the fall of Rome, because it's the Germanic tribes of Europe that, that go in and sack Rome and, and cause the fall uh, of Western Rome. And so, you know, th there has to be that, that point, that foundational point that takes Europe from being these separate tribal states to, you know, to bigger, more consolidated kingdoms that we start to see later on in the medieval period, like France, England, Spain, um, the Holy Roman Empire, you know, your big heavy hitting kingdoms that, that are going to emerge, you know, and Charlemagne is that foundational piece. And again, um, because of that, that's why he gets the nickname, the father of Europe. So uh, to kind of start, let's, let's kind of start right after the fall of Western Rome in about 500. And as you can see, if you look at this map, you can see what I'm talking about when I say that, you know, you've got tribal states after the fall of Rome emerge. So you've got the kingdom of the Burgundians, the Visigothic kingdoms, the Ostrogothic kingdoms are, is, is what's in red behind my head. Um, the kingdom of the Thuringians, uh, the Riparian Franks, the Lombards, the Angles and the Saxons. Um, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, you know, I know it's hard to wrap our minds around looking at Europe as a, as a, tr as a place of tribes, but that's what it was, you know, in our brains, we always, if, you know, the second we hear the word tribal or tribes, we automatically think of like our own Native Americans. Um, and I mean, you know, yeah, that's totally natural. And in a lot of ways, similar, you know, similar dynamics there, uh, you know, and so uh, students are always kind of surprised by that. You know, they're always like, what? You know, well, no, Europe wasn't just always kings. You know, it, it has to has to evolve into that politically. So um, obviously you can see there kind of in that olive darker green, you know, the conquests of Clovis. So Clovis is going to be that foundational piece to Charlemagne, which of course Charlemagne is the ultimate foundational piece to, you know, the, the more consolidating viewpoint of, of Europe. But Clovis is the predating foundational piece to Charlemagne. And he is going to, as you can see, create a pretty large little kingdom for himself. But he's also going to convert to Catholicism, 
which is huge, you know, as, as we talked about, you know, the Pope is going to fill that, that power vacuum within the city of Rome uh, that happens when it falls, you know, and the Pope's going to become not just kind of a religious leader, but a political leader. And as you start to see these Germanic tribes and their leaders convert to Catholicism, the Pope, of course, is going to take on an even bigger role in society throughout Europe, um, you know, because these kings are obviously going to him for advice as new Christians. He's also very excited and trying to help them even conquer more land because, hey, more land equals more power for Christendom. So, you know, uh, Clovis is that initial big Germanic ruler that converts. And um, Germanic society is, is a little different. Um, you know, obviously you don't have the 12 tables and, you know, the very like kind of structured Roman societal law taking place anymore once Western Rome falls. And so, you know, Germanic law comes into place. And the tribes, just like we think of a lot of times, again, the tribes in even America, there were tribes that didn't like each other. There were tribes that were more violent than others. Um, you know, there were families within these tribes that had blood feuds against each other and didn't like each other. Um, you know, honestly, Shakespeare even documented that a large part of his inspiration behind Romeo and Juliet dated back to like tribal Germanic society in the time of blood feuds amongst families. And, um, you know, and, and that was again, an inspiration behind, you know, the feud between the Montagues and the Caplets in Romeo and Juliet. But, um, you know, Clovis and leaders that followed Clovis wanted to get away from this kind of blood feud, revenge warfare type of culture uh, and wanted to try to kind of, again, start calming that down and consolidating more tribes into one kingdom. And so what they instilled to try to avoid these these blood feuds and stuff and, you know, people killing members of the other family and all that was the Virgild. So it's there in red on the slide. And it's basically like, okay, if you get into one of these fights with a rival family, you know, or a rival tribe or something like that, and, and you kill somebody, well, you're going to owe their family like the money that you just took away because you killed their, you know, their dad or their husband or their uncle or their main provider. And, um, you know, and so it, it essentially started putting kind of like bounties, uh, which I don't know, bounties maybe isn't the best analogy because people weren't killing people for money, which is what a bounty really kind of more is. But it was more about like, you don't want to kill this guy because, you know, he might be worth a lot dead the, and you have to pay the family that money, you know, so it's, it's just not worth it to get into these blood feud battles to the death anymore. Cause then we've got to turn around and again, like pay for his death to his family. Um, and another thing that they instilled was known as the trial by ordeal. And this is how the church really gets even more power, uh, in like everyday life in Europe. Because the ordeal was this trial, as it says, based on divine intervention. And so let's say it's not obvious that somebody committed a crime. Like they don't have the blood on their hands or like the stolen goods. They're not caught red-handed stealing. Well, what would happen is they would go through a trial again of an ordeal. So sometimes they would have to hold like red hot pokers in their hands for a certain amount of time. And then they'd have to let go. And they would have their hands bandaged up. And then like a few days later, the priest would look to see if the um, if the wounds were healing well or not. Well, if the wounds weren't healing well, then that was God's way of saying they're guilty. But if the wounds were healing well, then that was God's way of saying, well, they're innocent. Another way that they would do this is they would put people in like holy blessed water by the priest and if the person floated, 
then that meant that they were guilty because the water was trying to like get them out because the water was holy and the person was not. But if the person sank into the water, then that was proof that they were innocent because the water like accepted them into its body, basically. And so, you know, and again, that gave the priest a lot of power, uh, you know, in, in everyday life within these Germanic villages, because, you know, he, he not only becomes the religious leader and the political leader sometimes even of that area, but then all of a sudden he is now judge, jury, and potentially executioner because he is like the voice of God in that, in that spot. So, um, you know, this Germanic society uh, starts to kind of, again, evolve into the church having a much stronger foothold as you see these leaders and their kingdoms underneath them convert and even change the way they look at justice and stuff. So this is a fun little video that just kind of talks about, um, you know, the strange case of the law. Uh, they're specifically talking to a professor from the University of St. Andrews for a little while who um, specializes in like medieval Britain. And he mentions a few things that are kind of neat. So, um, you know, watch that, please. So finally, here we are, Charlemagne. Uh, so Charlemagne is born um, as a prince. His father was King Pepin the Short, is, that was his name. Um, you know, or the Short was obviously like his nickname, but his name was Pepin. And um, so he, he was, you know, raised a prince. He was the eldest son. He was educated well, and he was highly Christian. You know, I mean, this is kind of weird now, you know, let's see, about 200 or so years past Clovis. So the Frankish or Carolingian Empire is, is pretty rooted in, in Catholicism at this point. Now, there are large amounts of Germanic tribes around the Carolingians that are still pagan, and there are still even people here and there within the Carolingian Empire that are still pagan. And Charlemagne does not like this at all. Um, once, he, once his dad dies and he takes control um, his whole viewpoint is conquer in the name of God and convert. And his slogan was even like convert or die. I mean, everywhere that he went and conquered and, and there, if there were pagans, um, he really had a beef with the Saxons. The Saxons were the pagan Germanic tribe that kind of plagued him the most and that he wanted to see conquered the most in the name of the Christian God. And, and so he would go in there and, and just kind of like lay waste to villages and, you know, like tear down any type of pagan statues or monuments or temples. And um, anyways, again, like convert or die. Uh, very, very, very strong warrior uh, went out and helped conquer land with his army. Um, very, very, again, very smart, uh, set up schools all throughout his empire as well, because he wanted his people to have, you know, like just at least the bare minimum education, a uh, big, big supporter of that. He also standardized um, their coinage. And so that helped their economy. Uh, his reign is actually even considered like a bit of a renaissance period within the Dark Ages. Um, a lot of times we kind of think of the Dark Ages as like nothing's going on and it's just awful. And that it, well, under, under, under Charlemagne, that's actually not true. He does quite a bit to kind of propel the Carolingian Empire kind of forward after the fall of, of Rome. And, and again, like the breaking apart of, of Europe. So uh, Charlemagne is going to end up conquering what is now modern day France, Belgium, Lombard, Switzerland, parts of Germany, parts of Northern Italy. Uh, so as you can see, the whole like father of Europe title is, is pretty appropriate. But the biggest thing that happens to Charlemagne happens on actually Christmas Day in the year 800. He is crowned by the Pope himself as the new emperor of the Romans. And if you're kind of like, what? I thought Rome fell. What are you talking about? Spoiler alert. Every single major leader in Europe is going to like try to emulate the Romans and try to be all like, you know, I'm going to make my empire 
you know, that of the like Rome and I'm going to bring back the amazingness that was Rome and, and all of that. And so that's kind of what they're trying to do in the West. They're trying to rebuild the the magnitude of, of the Western Roman Empire as, you know, to, as back to what it used to be, but as with a Germanic Christian leader now controlling it. And, you know, the Pope also being involved in that, you know, so now we're seeing this kind of new, new face, you know, to, to Europe with, with these strong, you know, kind of kings that, that are Germanic, that have converted, that are in allegiance and in alliance with the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church kind of, again, remember, they're salty about being abandoned by the East and they don't like the Byzantine Empire and they also do not like the Eastern Orthodox Church. And so there's this very clear like rivalry still happening um, for centuries after the fall of Rome between East and West. And so Charlemagne again is, and, and the Pope Leo that crowns him are, it, it's kind of like, ha ha, look at us. Like, look at us. Now we have an emperor in the West and I am the Pope that has crowned him. And we are like going to become all powerful together. And they're very much kind of like, you know, doing this to the East, you know, to the patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox church and the Byzantine emperor, um, so this is the start of what becomes known as the Holy Roman Empire. And the Holy Roman Empire is going to stick around for a long time. Um, when you think of the Holy Roman Empire, you might as well just kind of think of what becomes modern day Germany and Austria. Okay. Um, that, that's kind of the territory that eventually it's going to really kind of stick within under Charlemagne. Obviously it's, it's a lot bigger than that, but, um, later on, it's going to kind of morph more into the territory that we think of as Germany and Austria. So, um, and the Holy Roman empire will be a pretty big player in, in European history for a while. So keep them in the back of your brain. Uh, all right. So anyways, that is the end of unit three. You have this video that's an infographics video about Charlemagne that gives you some good info. And um, be on the lookout tomorrow potentially for an Ed Puzzle video that I'm going to want you to do just for review or maybe a couple that are just short that will be good for review before your test on Wednesday because I know we've gone through this pretty quick. Uh, it's not a ton of information, but it's just been fast, and I understand that. So trying to kind of give you at least one day before the test to kind of, you know, wrap your mind around what we've talked about these three days. So thanks so much. See you all later.